Good morning and good afternoon to everyone and welcome. Thank you all for finding time and attending today's webinar, The Texture of Heterogeneous Catalysts, Surface Area and Porosity. My name is Jeff Kenvin, and I'm the Technical Director at Micromerdix Instrument Corporation, a global leader in material characterization technology. I'll be your moderator for today. Our speaker today is Dr. Luca Lucarelli. He's a technical application consultant. Before we start the webinar, let me um, explain how you can raise questions. If you have any questions on the content presented, raise them over the phone or write them to our chat in our Q&A session at the end of the webinar. The webinar recording will, will be available on our webinar landing page, so make sure you check back in about one and a half weeks. But you will also be provided a link to the recorded webinar via email once available. Now let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Luca Lucarelli. Luca received his degree from Milan State University in Italy in industrial chemistry. He has more than 30 years of experience in material and catalyst characterization, including textural characterization, mercury pore symmetry, gas pycnometry, chemisorption, and temperature program techniques. In addition to his expertise in characterization, he's been instrumental in instrument design and has held various positions within Carlo Urba and then Thermo Fisher Scientific. So with that, I'd like to start this morning's uh, webinar and turn it over to Dr. Lucarelli. Welcome everybody to this first webinar about heterogeneous catalyst characterization. Today we will talk about the physical characterization techniques providing information on the density, porosity and surface area and how this piece of information improves the knowledge about the performances of a catalyst. We will focus on some definitions related to catalyst and what happens in a catalytic process to better understand the role of porosity, density and surface area. Three main techniques will be described in detail, gas porosimetry, mercury porosimetry and pycnometry. Today's chemical and energy industry could not exist without catalysts. About 35% of the world's gross domestic product is directly influenced by the use of catalysts and almost 90% of the volume of all the chemical products is made by exploiting catalytic processes. For instance, the 48% of worldwide hydrogen used in the syngas is produced by the catalytic steam reforming of methane. Ammonia, an important component in fertilizers production, is synthesized by the Haber-Bosch process using metal-based catalysts. In 2016, 144 million tons of ammonia were produced. How can we define an heterogeneous catalyst? Catalysts can be defined in many ways, but generally it is a substance that, when added in the balance of a chemical reaction, accelerates the achievement of the chemical equilibrium between reactants and products, but without influencing the thermodynamic equilibrium of the process. Heterogeneous catalysts are in a different physical state to the reactants that usually are liquids or gases, thus they can be easily separated from the reaction environment. Catalysts are not consumed during the reaction, but undergo a slow transformation with use, causing a general decrease in their activity and changes in their selectivity. Among heterogeneous catalysts, we can identify three main groups, supported metal catalysts, acid-based catalysts, and the relatively new materials named metal-organic frameworks. Supported metal catalysts are prepared by fixing and dispersing a metal, the active phase, onto a porous material featuring a suitable physical properties in terms of pore size and total surface area that are optimized for the functionality of the chemical reaction. <clears throat> metal supported catalysts are commonly used in petrochemical processes, in pharmaceuticals, chemical intermediates, automotive industry, hydrogenation, dehydrogenation processes and more. Acid basic catalysts are mainly metal oxides or mixed oxides like zeolites. 
This catalyst are stable at high temperatures and mainly used in petrochemical processes for catalytic reforming, the hydration processes, oxidation, polymerization, etc. Metal organic frameworks are synthesized compounds where metal ions are coordinated to organic ligands to generate porous three dimensional structures. MOFs are currently studied for gas storage for hydrogen and methane, for carbon dioxide segregation, gas separation, and catalysis. Focusing on supported metal catalysts, they are constituted by an active component, a metal, dispersed on a high surface area support made of an inert porous material. The porosity of the support is defined in terms of volumetric pore size distribution and specific surface area. The metal in the support should be designed regarding a specific type of reaction. The metal is dispersed on the support in the form of aggregates, large metal particles fixed to the support. Only a small percentage of the metal remains exposed to chemical reagents, while the larger part of the aggregate is firmly incorporated within the support. In supported metal catalysts, it is essential to define the ratio between the number of metal atoms exposed to the reagents to those that are not exposed. This number represents the efficiency of the metal deposition process and it is named metal dispersion percentage. In a catalytic reaction, further to the knowledge of the energy profile, it is extremely important to study the reaction kinetic profile. This identifies which is the slower stage in the reaction and makes possible to apply the necessary correction to the process. Taking as an example a fixed bed tubular reactor filled with catalyst pellets, we can divide the catalytic process into seven steps. The first and the last steps are mainly related to the diffusion of reactants and products from the carrier flow to the catalyst. They are mainly related to parameters like reactor and catalyst geometry and reaction parameters. These stages may influence the degree of conversion because wall and preferential channeling may occur. Reactants literally escape from contact with the catalyst pellets, passing through the small void spaces between the pellets and the reactor wall. There are five main steps related to the catalyst itself. Step 2 and 6 are related to the diffusion of reactants from the fluid into the catalyst porous structure, reaching the internal surface and back diffusion of products through the support, reaching the external carrier. Step 3 and 5 are related to absorption of reactants on the active sites of the catalyst and the sorption of the products from the active sites. Finally, the step 4 is relevant to the chemical reaction itself. <laughs> One or more of the above stages could be the rate determining step, influencing the total speed of reaction. The speed related to steps 2 and 6 is mainly due to the porous nature of the support and the reactant and product molecular dimensions and surface charge. The pore size of the catalyst support should be chosen accordingly to avoid any diffusion limitations. Step 3, 4 and 5 are related to the interaction of the reactants and products with the active sites dispersed on the catalyst surface. If the diffusion is not the limiting effect, the speed of reaction is directly related to the active surface area of the catalyst. The higher the number of active sites available, the faster the speed of reaction. The characterization of a catalyst in terms of pore size, pore volume and specific surface area is of fundamental importance in understanding and avoiding diffusion limitations of the reactants and products. This information should also be integrated with the knowledge of the densities related to the catalyst structure. This can give us some clues on structural stability and thus lifetime. The most common techniques are gas absorption, mercury intrusion porosimetry and gas displacement pycnometry. Skeletal, apparent and bulk densities are typically measured by gas or fluid powder displacement. Specific surface area measured by PFIS sorption, pore specific volume and pore size distribution by PFIS sorption or mercury intrusion porosimetry depending on the pore size range. 
the active site concentration and metal dispersion on the support influence directly the catalyst activity and selectivity. Specific probe molecules are used to interact selectively with the active sites, enabling their quantification and measuring the energy related to the gas-solid interaction. Chemisorption, temperature program desorption and the reactions are of fundamental importance to relate the reactivity test to the catalyst specifications. Density is an important parameter in catalysis and can be conveniently used in relation to other material properties like total porosity. The definition of density depends on the solid volume definition. We will focus on three main definitions because they are the most used in catalysis. Bulk density is referred to the external sample volume, which is inclusive of all open and closed pores in a solid and intra plus inter particle voids in a particulate system. It can be measured by mercury porosimetry when the sample is under vacuum. In these conditions, mercury cannot penetrate any cavity smaller than about 650 microns. Envelope density refers to the external sample volume, but the definition changes depending on the sample nature. In case of a solid, the envelope volume is inclusive of all pores that cannot be penetrated by the measuring medium. In the case of a fluid powder displacement technique, this limit is about 110 microns. If we are dealing with a powder, the envelope volume excludes the interparticle voids. In some cases, it can be measured also by mercury porosimetry. Finally, the skeletal density refers to the material volume that excludes all the open cavities but includes the inaccessible porosity, that is, pores with no access to the environment. It can be determined by gas displacement technique. The difference between the bulk or the envelope volume and the skeletal volume provides the value for the total pore volume in the related pore size range. Let's have a quick overview of the techniques to measure solid and powder volumes used to calculate density. The gas displacement technique uses a gas, usually helium or nitrogen, which can penetrate all the accessible pores without being absorbed. A dried sample of known weight is placed in a calibrated measuring chamber. The gas is loaded into the calibrated sample chamber at a pressure over atmospheric, usually about 100 kPa gauge pressure. When the pressure is stable, the gas is expanded from the measurement chamber to a second calibrated reference chamber and the pressure is again allowed to equilibrate. And finally, the gas is vented to the atmosphere. By a simple mass balance, knowing all the pressures and the two calibrated volumes, the only unknown variable will be the sample skeletal volume. Skeletal because the measuring gas can penetrate even the narrower pores without diffusion limitations and without being absorbed. Similarly, applying the same principle but using a free-flowing powder, we can measure the envelope or bulk volume of a material that corresponds to the external volume occupied by the sample, enclosing all the pores smaller than the fluid powder particle, usually around 110 microns. The difference between the envelope or bulk volume and the skeletal volume of a given sample determines the total pore volume in the wider pore size range. This information is fundamental to validate the results from mercury intrusion porosimetry and to complete the information obtained by gas physisorption. There are two main techniques available to determine the total surface area, pore size distribution and pore volume of a material, mercury intrusion porosimetry and gas physisorption. Whilst the physisorption technique always provides information on the total surface area ranging from few square centimeters to thousands of square meters per gram, the technique for the pore size evaluation must be chosen according to the material pore size itself. Mercury intrusion is the choice for large pores, while gas physisorption should be used for narrow pores having dimension of the same order of magnitude as the gas molecules used. Pores are classified according to three main groups. Micropores up to 2 nanometers, mesopores between 2 and 50 nanometers, and the macropores over 50 nanometers. The complete pore size range covers about seven orders of magnitude 
and there is no single technique covering the whole range. Within the main pore size classification, additional subgroups have recently been identified, like the ultra and super micropores and the nanopores. The gas physisorption technique allows the user to obtain the specific surface area on virtually all materials independent of their pore size. Physisorption is used principally to determine pore sizes in the micro and mesopore size range, but it can also be useful for smaller macropores. Starting from about 3 nanometers, mercury porosimetry completes the information on pore sizes up to more than 650 microns, depending on the nature of the sample and the pore. Both techniques are commonly used for the characterization of catalyst and catalyst supports. Mercury porosimetry is a widely accepted method for determining total pore volume pore size distribution in the meso and macropore ranges. Mercury does not wet most substances and will not penetrate pores by capillary action. Liquid mercury has a high surface tension and molecular forces on the surface film tend to contract its volume into a form with the lowest surface area. Consequently, the entry of mercury into pores requires applying a pressure that is inversely proportional to the opening size. The higher the applied pressure, the smaller the pores to be penetrated. MIP is a suitable technique to study all porous materials and powders which are not wetted by mercury, but some metals will produce amalgams like metallic gold, aluminium, copper, nickel, silver. In some cases, these materials can be analyzed by mercury intrusion but require a prior oxidation. Mercury porosimetry is not recommended for compressible or fragile materials. The intrusion pressure of mercury into pores is related to pore size through the Washburn equation. Knowing the mercury surface tension and the contact angle between mercury and sample, then the pore size range depends only on the applied pressure. Usually the lower applicable pressure is about 0.002 MPa and the maximum pressure 414 MPa, giving a measurable pore size range between 650 microns and 3.6 nanometers. In MIP we must consider several assumptions. The technique measures the entry size of the pores and associates the intruded mercury volume, thus the pore volume, to these sides without considering more complex situations. Pores are assumed to be of cylindrical shape, thus they are represented like a capillary bundle, while in real life structures are much more complex. And finally, the materials under test should be mechanically stable since the maximum applied pressure of 414 MPa may compress or collapse the structure, especially in the presence of closed pores. It is important to understand the process of mercury intrusion to avoid misinterpretation of the results. Let's use the example of a material having a pore network submitted to mercury intrusion. When reaching pressure P1, the pore having the axis of diameter D1 is intruded by mercury. But in presence of a pore network, we might have other pores with the interconnecting throats of different diameters. Pores having axis through diameter D3, larger than D1, are already filled at P1. Therefore, the total intruded volume at this pressure is associated to the diameter D1 and D3 is not detected. Pores with SSD2 smaller than D1 are intruded at higher pressures P2, but there is no way to understand if the SS is on the surface or inside the pore network. For these reasons, mercury intrusion results should be interpreted rather than simply reporting the numbers. Possibly the results on mercury intrusion should be validated by other analytical techniques like gas physisorption and skeletal plus bulk density. Mercury porosimetry is a perfect technique for comparative purposes. 
The use of skeletal and bulk density is a given important contribution to the validation of mercury intrusion results in terms of proper pore volume determination. The difference between the bulk and skeletal volumes provides the real value of the total pore volume starting from about 650 microns. We can have three situations in relation to this total pore volume. The pore volume detected by mercury intrusion is lower Thus, we don't account for some of the pore presence. Probably the material has pores smaller than the mercury intrusion limit of about 3 nanometers. The mercury intrusion pore volume is higher, thus the sample is probably compressed or collapsed due to the pressure. The third situation is when the two pore volumes are very close to each other. Then we can validate the pore volume measured by the mercury intrusion technique because a sample doesn't have pores smaller than about 3 nanometers and it is mechanically stable to pressure. In this example of mercury intrusion applied to porous teflon, the intrusion curve overtakes the pore volume line calculated by bulk and skeletal volume difference meaning that the sample has been properly compressed. There are precautions to be taken regarding the use of mercury due to toxicity. Samples are contaminated after testing and must be properly disposed of by a chemical waste handling company. Despite these limitations, mercury intrusion porosimetry is still today the only technique that can measure pores in such a wide size range. The technique is normalized by international standards and instrumentation can be validated by certified reference materials. It is the perfect technique for comparative testing. The Micromeretics Autopore series offers a functional design that is easy for the user to interact with. The experiment is fully automated and the microactive software offer a user-friendly interface for experimental control and data processing which is managed through a graphical user interface. In addition to the classical results concerning pore size, volume and porosity, one can expand the knowledge of fluid transport via analysis of tortuosity and permeability. Material compressibility and particle size distribution can also be determined for suitable materials. Gas adsorption is probably the most widely used technique to measure the exposed surface area of solid materials and powders. It measures pore sizes in the micro and mesopore range. Gas adsorption is generally performed under isothermal conditions. The temperature and the nature of the adsorbate play a role in the mechanism of adsorption. Adsorption is a phenomenon that involves a higher density of gas molecules in proximity to solid surfaces due to the free surface energy of atoms and molecules in the solid interface which are not bounded by other molecules. The free surface energy is quite weak in the order of the van der Waals forces. At a relatively high temperature, like room temperature, gas molecules have a high kinetic energy compared to the free surface energy. That is to say, they move too fast. When approaching the flat surface of a non-porous solid, they are trapped only for a negligible time frame on the surface, thus the amount of gases adsorbed in these conditions and on flat surfaces cannot be conveniently measured. Things change when the material is porous, and pores are very small, close to the dimension of the gas molecule. In this situation, a microporous solid can adsorb gas molecules also at room temperature, when the gas is inert, such as with nitrogen, argon or krypton, to promote the adsorption we must decrease the kinetic energy of the gas, thus cryogenic temperatures are required. When the nitrogen molecule, for instance, kept at liquid nitrogen temperature, approaches a solid surface, it will be trapped by the attractive force due to the free surface energy. In the case of cryogenic temperatures and inner gases, the adsorption process is named physisorption and consists in a high density of gas molecules in close proximity to the solid surface. On the other hand, when the gas is reactive like hydrogen or carbon monoxide, and the surface is active, such as a metal, at relatively high temperatures a real chemical reaction occurs as at the gas-solid interface, giving place to a new surface chemical compound. This phenomenon is called chemisorption. 
One of the most common methods to determine adsorption is the static manometric gas adsorption technique. It can be applied to both physisorption and chemisorption. The method is quite simple. The pneumatic system is formed by a volume calibrated manifold and a second manifold where the sample under test is connected by means of a glass tube. The experiment begins under vacuum. The sample must have been previously degassed so that all the surface pollutants like physisorbent water vapor are removed and the dry weight can be measured. The sample is maintained at the desired isothermal cryogenic temperature for physisorption. At this point, the probe gas is dosed to the calibrated manifold, and when the pressure is stabilized, the manifold temperature and gas pressure are recorded. The sample then is put in contact with the probe gas by opening the interconnected valve between the two manifolds, and the sample begins to absorb. When equilibrium between the gas and the absorbed phase is reached, the instrument records the equilibrium pressure, and the next gas injection begins. The mass balance is simple. The injected number of gas molecules will be the same as the sum of adsorbent molecules plus the gaseous molecules generating the equilibrium pressure. The system undertakes a free space measurement which can be at the start or at the end of the experiment. By reproducing a similar gas expansion from the manifold to the sample zone, but using a gas that cannot be adsorbed at that temperature condition, that is to say helium. In static systems, several sequential equilibrium points are collected and corresponding amount of gas adsorbed is calculated. We can build the adsorption uh, curve by plotting the adsorbed gas amount referred to sample mass unit versus the equilibrium pressure. This representation of adsorption is termed the adsorption isotherm. Recently, UPAC updated the original classification of isotherms, adding two types to the original six and classifying also the shape of the hysteresis loops. This is because in recent years, several new materials have been developed, presenting some intermediate characteristics. Today, UPAC recognizes eight types of adsorption isotherms and six types of hysteresis loops. <coughs> Catalysts usually are made of supports, mainly showing micro and mesopores or non-porous particle system, like in case of fluidized bed catalysts. Therefore, we will focus our attention to isotherms type 1, 2, and 4. Isotherms type 1 are divided into two sub-definitions. Type 1A is related to micropores with less than 1 nanometer size, and Type 1B to micropores ranging from 1 nanometer up to 2.5 nanometers. The main difference is in the degree of curvature in, of the region named the knee of the isotherm. These samples show a very high equivalent surface area due to micropores and a very small external surface area. Examples of these materials are molecular sieves, zeolites, activated carbons, microporous oxides, and MOFs. The isotherm type 1 are reversible. The desorption branch of the isotherms follows the adsorption branch. Isotherm type 1 is also typical of irre irreversible chemisorption, namely the Langmuir isotherm. Isotherms type 2 are related to adsorption on macroporous or non-porous materials with pores larger than 100 nanometers and non-porous powders. The surface area is ranging from low to very low, and it is due mainly to the external surface. Examples of materials are carbon black, ashes, alpha alumina, active pharmaceuticals, etc. The isotherm in this case is reversible. For materials with pores larger than 100 nanometers, the pore size can be determined with mercury intrusion porosimetry. The isotherm type 4A is given by mesoporous material but in larger mesopores from 4 to 50 nanometers and in some cases up to 100 nanometers. Pores are considered to be cylindrical and the surface area can be relatively high. Isotherm type 4B is related to mesopores ranging from 2 to 4 nanometers of cylindrical or conical shape which are closed to the tapered end. The surface area can be high in relation to the pore size and pore volume. This isotherm can be found in mesoporous molecular sieves, gamma lumina and silica, and it is reversible. Isotherm type 3 is reversible and it is generally related to non-porous samples measured with adsorbates showing very weak adsorption forces like with water vapor. 
it is not possible to define precisely the surface area in this case. Isotherm type 5 shows the hysteresis loop. It is relevant to micro and mesoporous hydrophobic adsorbents like hydrophobic carbons analyzed with the water vapor. And finally, the isotherm type 6 is reversible. It is given when analyzing highly uniform non-porous surfaces like graphitized carbon black with a low surface area. Also, the hysteresis loop can be used as a fingertip of the pore shapes. The hysteresis picture can indicate a wide or narrow pore size distribution, cylindrical ink bottle pores and pore networks presence. The table relates the most common pore shapes to the loop images. In this table, we report the main characteristics of physisorption. Inner gases like nitrogen, argon, or krypton are mainly subject to physisorption at cryogenic temperatures. The physisorption energy is quite weak, being the absorption enthalpy like the heat of gas liquefaction. Physisorption is a non-dissociative and non-specific process, meaning that the phenomenon is independent of the, on the surface chemistry and it is generally reversible under isothermal condition, just removing the gaseous phase by applying, va applying vacuum, for instance. Physisorption gives place to multilayer adsorption due to the gas-gas interactions in addition to the gas-solid ones. And finally, the process of physisorption is quite fast, being a non-activated process, with some exceptions in case of ultramicropores, where diffusion limitation due to the pore size takes place. Summarizing, physisorption experiments provide a reliable measurement of the total specific surface area independent on, independent on the pore size or the presence of pores. Pore size distribution is limited to pores usually with a size less than 100 nanometers, therefore the pore volume provided by physisorption experiments is related to this upper measurement limit. Larger pores require different techniques with mercury intrusion porosimetry often being the ideal tool for such analysis. Depending on the required information and on the sample's pore size, static manometric physisorption instruments should be properly configured in terms of their vacuum performances and the resolution in the pressure transducer used. Microporous samples require instruments with high vacuum systems and low range pressure transducers. The magnitude of the surface area is directly related to the pore size and the available pore volume. Generally, larger amount of gas adsorbed and smaller pore size lead to high surface area. Specific surface can vary from few square centimeters per gram in non-porous or macroporous solids to thousands of square meters per gram in microporous materials. <laughs> Focusing on isotherms of type 1 and 4, in the example we have a combination of the two. The absorption process begins at very low pressure in micropores. The limiting uptake is related to the accessible micropore volume rather than by the internal surface. In fact, in case of micropores, we talk about constriction because the amount of gas adsorbed is controlled by the enhanced adsorbent adsorbent interaction in pores having dimensions that are similar to the molecular dimension of the gas. Increasing the pressure, we reach a region where the monolayer multilayer adsorption on the mesopore walls takes place. In addition to the gas solid interaction, here we observe also the gas gas interaction, followed by condensation of the adsorbate in a liquid like phase. This phenomenon is named capillary condensation. When all the mesopores are filled by the liquid adsorbate, generally a plateau is found before reaching the real saturation pressure. When this step is evident and well defined, it is possible to calculate the total adsorbed liquid volume at this point, thus the specific pore volume is in the detectable range. In a micropores, the potentials of both sides of the pore walls overlap, enhancing the adsorption potential. The smaller the pore size, the deeper the potential becomes, resulting in an increased adsorption energy. Adsorption in micropores takes place at extremely low pressures. Smaller micropores fill firstly, but adsorption on the surface of larger micropores occurs at the same time. Some points of remark. In micropores, we have a very limited number of layers formation. 
Microporous materials are best tested with high precision static volumetric methods. At low relative pressure, the surface of the mesopore walls adsorbs a multi layer of adsorbate. When the pressure is raised over 0.4 relative pressure, droplets of adsorbate may occur on optimal energetic points of, of the mesopore surface. When the droplets touch each other, the pores will be filled spontaneously with the condensed adsorbate, even if the pressure is still below the saturation pressure. The larger the mesopores, the higher is the capillary condensation pressure. The condensed adsorbate will evaporate during the desorption process, showing core openings larger than the Kelvin radius. Some points are to note. We have a multilayer adsorbate formation followed by capillary condensation into mesopores at higher pressures. Larger mesopores lead to the formation of the hysteresis loop. Mesoporous materials are best tested with static volumetric methods, but also dynamic is possible for surface area determination only. The BAT theory can be applied to multilayer adsorption to type 2 and type 4 isotherms in the range between 0.05 and 0.3 relative pressure, and in a lower range also to type 1 isotherms. Brunauer, Emmett, and Teller derived a three parameters equation describing the isotherms very well, where the three unknown parameters should be evaluated. Vm is the monolayer volume that corresponds to the number of gas molecules covering the surface in the first single layer, n is the number of layers, and C is a thermodynamic term concerning the heat of adsorption on the surface. Because the equation is nonlinear, simplifications were made. By setting n equal to 1, the original equation gives the Langmuir model that is related to a single layer formation. While setting n to infinite, we obtain the more popular form of the equation known as the BAT two parameters that can be easily linearized and solved. The monolayer volume resulting from the application of the BAT equation is used to calculate the specific surface area. In fact, the monolayer volume corresponds to the monolayer capacity, that is the number of molecules covering the surface after the first layer is formed. Knowing the area covered by a single gas molecule, that is the cross-sectional area, we get the total exposed surface of the porous material. It is like measuring the area of a billiard table by completely covering it with billiard balls. The most common calculation method for the surface area is the BAT model that, with some precautions, can be applied also to microporous materials. The T-plot can distinguish the surface area contribution external to micropores, particularly important when both micro, mesopores or macropores are present. The BJH calculation is mainly applicable to mesopores from 50 to 7 nanometer size, but the more realistic and broader pore size investigation is given by the density functional theory and the non-local density functional theory. Isotherms can be studied using several calculation models providing information on the surface area and on the pore size. Most of calculation models can be applied in a specific pressure range. In case of micropores, adsorption takes place at extremely low relative pressures, starting from 10 to minus 9. To analyze properly this kind of materials, high performance vacuum systems and extremely low range pressure transducers are required. Usually, each calculation model should be applied in a specific pressure range. This is an example of a zeolite showing an isotherm type 1A that is identified by the typical knee of 90 degrees and the absence of hysteresis between adsorption and desorption branches, indicating that mesopores are not present. <laughs> adsorption begins at very low relative pressure, about 10 to minus 7, as clearly shown in the log scale graph. The equivalent surface area can be calculated by the BAT equation according to the rock roll principle. The relative pressure range has a higher limit of about 10 to minus 2, whereas on other types of isotherms this limit is set to 0.3 relative pressure. The most convenient and realistic method for the pore size determination is the non-local density functional theory approach that in this case gives a pore size in the range of supermicropores, about 0.7 to 1 nanometer. 
the goodness of the NLDFT fit can be put in evidence in the adsorption region on the log scale because the relative pressure is extremely low. In this slide, we can clearly see the difference between isotherms type 1A given by a zeolite and an isotherm type 1B given by an activated carbon. The zeolite pore size peak is about 0.9 nanometer with a sharp range of 0.4 nanometer from 0.7 to 1.1, while the active carbon shows a peak at 1.3 nanometers, but the range is broader, almost a double, about 0.8 nanometers from 1 to 1.8, resulting in the 1B isotherm type. Despite the zeolite pore size being smaller, the adsorbed volume is larger for the carbon, giving a surface area of more than 900 square meter per gram versus the 860 square meter per gram for the zeolite. Overlaying the two isotherms shows an obvious difference in the knee, identifying the broader pore size of the carbon. A typical example of a type 4A isotherm is given by a mesoporous silica alumina. In this case, the capillary condensation phenomenon is evidenced by the presence of the hysteresis loop. The total pore volume in the nanopores can be calculated at the plateau region before saturation by converting the volume of gas adsorbed into the corresponding liquid volume. The pore size distribution can be calculated using the BJH method. In case of type 4 isotherms and type 2 on macro or non-porous materials, the T-plot surface area is very similar to the BAT surface area. The T-plot model in the case of micro and mesopores can conveniently distinguish between the surface area contribution of the two types of pores. In case of micropores, the T-plot provides information about the micropore volume, while the surface area is related to the meso and the macropores. Comparing the BAT area to the T-plot, it is possible to distinguish the contribution of micropores and mesopores. Microactive is the ultimate software developed by Micromeretics. It can reprocess data from almost all the analytical instruments running physics sorption, mercury porosimetry, gas pycnometry, and in addition also chemisorption calculations and temperature program experiments data processing. In the case of physical characterization, in addition to the most updated models, Microactive features two important procedures. One involves the DFT method and mercury porosimetry, and the second by combining the DFT pore size derived by two different physisorption experiments with nitrogen or argon and carbon dioxide. Some materials show a wide pore range that can't be disclosed by a single technique. Microactive can combine the pore size calculation by DFT with the mercury intrusion results on the same material. This is a very useful piece of information because the complete pore size can be represented in a single graph. In the example, this zeolite was submitted to a demetallation process to introduce mesopores in the micropore structure. The software allows to combine the two pore size distributions in a single useful graph. Microactive software allows the study of micropores even in the case where a high vacuum instrument is not available, like in case of a static manometric apparatus with a simple rotative vacuum pump that can reach 10 to minus 3 tor. In this case, it is possible to perform two physisorption experiments, the first as usual with nitrogen or argon at cryogenic temperatures, and the second experiment using carbon dioxide at 273 Kelvin. <laughs> As we can see from the log scale, the nitrogen isotherm can't measure enough points in the low pressure region because the instrument is not equipped with a thermomolecular pump and a suitable low, low pressure transducer. Thus, micropore size can't be measured. The carbon dioxide isotherm, on the contrary, covers a much lower relative pressure range because the saturation pressure of carbon dioxide at this temperature is very high, more than 26,000 torr. Microactive features a unique option to combine the two isotherms by an advanced application of the non-local density functional theory model. This gives the possibility to investigate micropore size even in case the instrument is not properly equipped for this task.
In this last slide, some of the analytical techniques described in the presentation are related to the instruments offered by Micromeratics. Density, pore and particle size, surface area analyzers are part of Micromeratics portfolio since many years. Today, Micromeratics can also provide complementary techniques to further aid the textural characterization of surfaces. Thanks you all for your attention. Luca, thank you very much for your presentation this morning and this afternoon. Uh, I'm opening the chat for everyone's questions now, and we already have a few. Um, we have one from someone that's using mercury pore symmetry to measure both intrusion and extrusion, and they ask, why do they observe hysteresis? Uh, okay, Jeff, thank you um, for, for, for the question. Uh, okay, the hysteresis in, in mercury intrusion uh, is uh, due to uh, several reasons. There is not only one. Uh, first of all, um, there is uh, the, the rates between uh, the throat and the pore diameter is one of the reasons. The typical example is the, the ink bottle pores that are pores with a large volume but they are, that are connected to, with the external or to the pore network through a, a very small access. So what happens is that when mercury fills the ink bottle pores, there is not enough energy, uh, let me pass me the term, in the extrusion uh, to remove the mercury from the pores uh, at the same pressure uh, when, when mercury entered the pore. Uh, so we need more energy to remove mercury. Uh, other reason can be the difference between the contact angle uh, in the intrusion and the extrusion. Uh, of course, the contact angle uh, uh, when, when the mercury is inside the pore is not so uh, easy to be, to be measured and calculated. And finally, uh, um, uh, the hysteresis is also due when we have a complex uh, uh, poor network. So, but the main reason is that we need more energy to remove mercury from the pores uh, than the pressure required to intrude the mercury in these pores. Thank you, Luca. We also have a follow-up question. Um, why does the hysteresis not loop not close for mercury pore symmetry? Uh, yes, because um, uh, let's say um, that there are also, in this case, there are several reasons. Um, one reason is when we reduce the pressure to extrude mercury, it is possible that we need to uh, a very low pressure. And usually the high pressure experiments terminate at atmospheric pressure. So going below atmospheric pressure is not possible with the, with the actual uh, equipment, and therefore part of the mercury remains trapped into the, into the pore structure. And uh, the other reason is always the presence of a pore network, and the mercury remains trapped uh, in, in some pores against typing bottle pores that uh, remain uh, um, connected with, uh, with the smaller asses. Uh, I have a question here on gas adsorption. Uh, is there any special preparation before measuring the adsorption isotherm and especially for measuring BET surface area? Uh, yes. Um, so any sample uh, prior the, the experiment uh, um, should be uh, properly degassed. What does it mean, uh, the, the gassing process? The, the gassing process uh, means that we have to remove all the adsorbed vapors, mainly water vapor, that is contained inside the porous structure of the material. Now, it happens that uh, uh, there are two main reasons. First, the, the, the water vapor, or the pollutant anyway, uh, is uh, attracted in the pore structure by the, free, the, by the free surface energy. So the first task is to remove these molecules and to activate the free surface energy. The second reason is that uh, um, main samples, main porous material are particularly hydroph hydrophilic. So it means that they absorb humidity from the environment. And uh, uh, all these results uh, provided by physisorption and also mercury porosimetry are referred to the sample mass unit and uh, must be referred to the dry sample mass unit. 
So we can make errors, uh, big errors, if we don't take into account that uh, some water can be absorbed in the porous structure. Thus, the weight uh, must be uh, dry. Otherwise, uh, we cannot have a reproducible and comparative results. Uh, there's also another question on BET surface area. And someone asks, when they measure BET surface area, they occasionally get a C value from the BET equation that's negative. Uh, what can they do to correct this problem? Uh, okay. Um, for, for, so C should not be negative, first of all, because uh, it, it is a term that contains the, the absorption entropy, so can, cannot be physically uh, uh, negative. So the reason, uh, the, I, what I see is mainly two reasons. The first one is related to the, uh, uh, to the instrument. So probably the free space has not been properly measured or uh, we have a leak uh, in the vacuum system in static, uh, in static manometric uh, apparatuses. Uh, the second reason is that uh, the upper limit for the BAT application is too high. And uh, uh, very often, is if you apply the BAT uh, to microporous material, that is to type 1 isotherms, and we don't choose properly the, the, the range, and we keep the upper limit at a too high relative pressure, the uh, linearized BAT straight line uh, has a negative intercept, that is a C, a negative C. So in this case, it is easy to adapt, the, the, um, we can solve easily this problem by adapting the pore size, uh, the applicability of the BAT in a, in a lower, uh, relative pressure uh, range. This is most, mo most reasons for negative C. Thank you. Um, we have a question referring to macropore volume measurements. Can nitrogen physisorption be used to accurately measure the, micro, the macropore volume? Uh, not really, because um, uh, the, as, as we have seen uh, in uh, the uh, isotherm type 4, uh, the um, uh, region of the capillary condensation occurs uh, uh, before reaching the saturation pressure of nitrogen. Uh, or of the gas used in, uh, in the physisorption experiment. So what happens is that uh, the larger are the pores, the higher is the capillary condensation region. There is a point at which uh, the capillary condensation pressure uh, arrives to the saturation pressure of the gas that we are using. Therefore, the two phenomena at a certain point uh, coexist, and uh, any further gas injection into the system generates a liquid, uh, uh, a liquefied gas, so that we can't measure anymore. So for micro macroporous materials, uh, we have to use other techniques, um, let's say mercury intrusion porosimetry, or conveniently it is possible to use the difference between the bulk volume uh, or the envelope volume, depending if it is a solid or a powder, and uh, the skeletal volume of a material. This is, uh, in my opinion, the best way to measure the complete pore volume in a porous material. Because uh, when we measure the bulk volume, for instance, with mercury intrusion, we, uh, our starting limit is uh, more than 650 microns. And when we measure the volume of the skeletal volume of the material with a gas picnometer, we can exclude all the open porosity. So the difference between these two volumes gives the real total pore volume of the material in the wider pore size range. And this is very useful to um, validate mercury intrusion porosimetry. And, uh, and always uh, uh, I, I see that uh, uh, um, very often uh, the, in, in some publications, uh, it is reported the mercury intrusion volume as a total pore volume, but uh, very often this, uh, this uh, result is not validated by other techniques. Uh, there's a follow-up question um, with that. And that is, if the material has a hierarchy of pores, um, should we compare nitrogen physisorption and mercury intrusion? Okay, this is uh, <laughs> uh, this is a, a question uh, that is uh, 
uh, let's say that depends depends on the material if we have a ordinate uh, ordered pore structures with uh, um, with the uh, cylindrical pores ordered cylindrical pores the pore size given n sorry and we know exactly the contact angle between mercury and this material the pore size uh, between the gas adsorption and mercury porosimetry provided that the pores are in the in the range covered by both technique are very similar but generally speaking for most of material the two uh, the two results by physics orphan and mercury porosimetry should be considered separately and uh, and this because mainly due to mercury porosimetry we have to put many many some assumptions uh, that we have seen in the presentation so first of all mercury measure only the assets of the pores and we have no information about the size inside of the pores inside the structure and uh, then uh, materials uh, must not be compressible uh, very often very often the contact angle between mercury and the material is unknown so that's why uh, the uh, in some uh, uh, standard uh, recommendation in the ISO recommendation it is recommended when the, the contact angle is unknown to use 140 degree so due uh, to all these reasons i would say that uh, um, the comparison between the pore size of physics orphan and mercury porosimetry must be considered very careful. Luca, I have another question here on low surface area materials. Um, do you need any specialty adsorbents if you're going to very low surface area? For example, perhaps maybe less than one meter square per gram. Uh, yes, usually uh, we need uh, we need to change gas at this uh, at this uh, uh, when uh, degree of a surface area, and uh, generally it is recommended the use of krypton because krypton uh, at a liquid nitrogen temperature. Um, okay, krypton is quite expensive, but uh, uh, overtakes some issues due to uh, nitrogen uh, interaction with the free surface energy in case of extremely low surface area areas. Uh, another thing is also uh, this depends on uh, the, mm, the instrument and uh, the uh, technique that is applied by, by the instrument. For instance, in mic micrometrics, uh, um, I was quite impressed by uh, the Gemini, because this Gemini uh, has a, a special uh, um, technique that is a comparative technique between two uh, sample tubes. In one, we have the sample; the other is uh, is empty. So the instrument can measure very precisely the differential of the pressure between uh, a, a region where we have. Uh, a very small adsorbent gas and the, pre and, and the other region where we don't have adsorption. And uh, so with, uh, with the, this technique, it is possible to measure even surface area lower than one square meter per gram just using nitrogen and avoiding the issues related to krypton. Because uh, uh, apart from the gas price, uh, also the equipment must be is very expensive because you need to equip uh, the machine with a turbo molecular pump low pressure transducers because the krypton experiment usually starts from high vacuum but uh, it ends up uh, at about two tor so in the range between zero and two tor we need enough point to apply the bat so uh, krypton is is a very is a, very elegant way to measure very low surface area, but it's also expensive. The next question is on the use of standard isotherm techniques. When would you use an alpha S plot versus when would you use T plot? But let's say the T plot uh, is um, usually I, I, I prefer the use of T plot, uh, even if there are a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, criticism on this. Uh, the T plot practically uh, uh, is uh, the representation of the isotherm, uh, ver not versus the relative pressure, but uh, versus uh, the, uh, the depth of the layers um, uh, covering uh, a surface, a flat surface, a non-porous surface, 
uh, of the same material that we, we are testing. So the T-plot uh, can easily differentiate the contribution of the surface area external to micropores. So what happens uh, when we analyze a microporous material that can also have a mesopores or macropores, um, we can uh, easily identify, first of all, with the T-plot, the micropore volume, because the intercept of the linearization gives uh, the micropore volume, uh, while the slope of the linearization gives the surface area that is external of the micropores. So what happens is that when we apply the BAT by the rock roll approach, for instance, and we measure the surface area in microporous material, and then we apply the T-plot, we can see which is the contribution of, uh, uh, by difference between the BAT and the T-plot area, we can see which is the contribution of the meso or macropores to the total of surface area uh, compared to the contribution of, of micropores. Uh, in addition, the T-plot can also uh, evaluate in the, in the upper end, when we have isotherm type 4, uh, the, um, the volume of mesopores in addition to the volume of, uh, of the micropores. So uh, let's say the alpha plot instead is uh, plotting the, the amount of gas absorbed versus uh, uh, the uh, a reference value of uh, uh, absorbed gas uh, at a relative pressure of about 0.4, but gives, uh, uh, my opinion, less information than the T-plot. T-plot is more useful, especially when we have uh, 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 micro and mesopores together. Should we use adsorption or desorption with BJH for characterizing mesopores? But there has been a long discussion on this, uh, if using the, the uh, adsorption branch or desorption branch. Uh, now, uh, okay, I'm not a scientist in this field, but uh, the recommendation is to use the desorption branch, uh, provided that we use also the proper correction uh, from, for the, the, the layer of nitrogen um, still deposed on, on the mesopore walls. Uh, this because when the evaporation takes place from the mesopores, uh, the, the liquid uh, uh, gas is evaporating in the core of the pores. And uh, so to, uh, to have the real dimension of the pore where the condensed gas is evaporating, we have to add the Kelvin radius to the T, that is the layer that is still absorbed on, on, on the pore wall. In this way, we can, uh, we can have a proper and more realistic pore size distribution. Um, the, the only thing is that uh, the BJH calculation um, is no more reliable for pores uh, less than seven nanometers because the mechanism of evaporation is different. So in this case, it is better to use other calculation methods. Um, for physisorption measurements, what are the pros and cons of using different adsorbates, nitrogen versus argon versus krypton? Um, so the choice of the adsorbate. So usually, usually the nitrogen is the most commonly used adsorbate at the liquid nitrogen temperature. Uh, first, because liquid nitrogen is uh, relatively inexpensive, it is a subproduct of the oxygen, liquid oxygen, oxygen production, and uh, and second, because it works well with the most of materials. In some cases, we have to use argon for microporous uh, um, materials like uh, zeolites uh, because nitrogen has a quadruple moment. So when we have a zeolite that generally is made by uh, silica and, and uh, silicium and aluminium uh, joined together by oxygen bridges, we have a surface charge in the pores especially when we have a pores of molecular dimension of the gas. So nitrogen in, in, in some cases can't be absorbed because um, uh, it is repulsed by the surface charge in the pores and due to the quadruple moment of nitrogen. So this kind of material when analyzed with nitrogen um, looks like they are non-porous. And uh, while using argon, uh, argon is a noble gas, is a monatomic uh, uh, molecule, has no quadruple moment, has not a surface charge. So it can be easily absorbed in this kind of materials. 
So for, for this particular zeolite with, with the very narrow pores, um, it is more convenient the use of argon and hopefully at liquid argon temperature. Um, the liquid argon temperature is, uh, uh, is, is better used in this case because uh, we can have uh, a uh, wider range uh, um, of, in the isotherm. Because if we use argon at liquid nitrogen temperature, the saturation is about a, three, a little bit more than 300 Tor. So that the resolution of the isotherm will be lower. While using argon at liquid argon temperature, the saturation pressure uh, is uh, a little bit higher than, a few tors higher than the atmospheric pressure. And finally, krypton is used for very low surfaces um, using uh, liquid, uh, liquid nitrogen temperature. And I already uh, talked about this uh, before. Another gas that can be used for micropores, as we have seen in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the example, is carbon dioxide. Uh, the advantage of a carbon dioxide is that uh, it can be used at uh, temperatures ranging from uh, zero Celsius up to room temperature. In this case, uh, we do not have uh, um, diffusive limitations due to the low temperature that in some cases uh, prevent the, the gas to be absorbed in, uh, in, uh, into micropores. And in addition, uh, uh, the, the CO2 experiment um, provides high resolution even in case our static volumetric system is not equipped for, for generating very high vacuum. And, uh, and uh, as we have seen in one of the slides, we can combine uh, the, the two isotherms to have uh, a complete pore size distribution, uh, in, even in micropores, and even if we don't have uh, an instrument that is equipped uh, in a suitable way. Luca, why do we use relative pressure for adsorption isotherms and BET calculations rather than absolute pressure? Uh, yes, because um, uh, let's say the, the pressure uh, in, a, in a static uh, manometric system uh, depends on the temperature. And uh, um, an equipment has usually the calibrated manifold where we sample the gas before the injection into the sample holder. It's uh, usually thermostated at a certain temperature so that uh, when we dose the gas uh, into the sample zone, uh, the, the container where we keep the gas before the injection is at a known temperature and the known volume and known pressure. So we know exactly how many molecules of gas we can inject uh, into, the, into the sample zone. But what happens in the sample zone? Uh, it is not possible to have a completely uniform temperature and the sample usually is kept inside a, a bath of a, a liquid nitrogen, for instance. Now, as uh, we, we, every, everybody knows, the, the, temper, the boiling temperature of a liquid depends on the atmospheric pressure. So what happens is that uh, if we are analyzing physisorption at the sea level, or we are analyzing the same material in Mexico City, that is about 2,000 meter elevation over the sea level, so the liquid boiling temperature of nitrogen is different. Being different the temperature, it will be different the pressure inside the uh, uh, sample tube because the system is closed. It's a static manometric system. So what happens is that uh, uh, in, in order to, uh, to have always the same uh, uh, pressure on the x-axis and to compare results worldwide, we need to refer the equilibrium pressure to something that is external to the apparatus, that is uh, the, uh, the boiling temperature of liquid nitrogen. So we can uh, measure, uh, any equipment can measure the saturation pressure of the gas used in physisorption at that temperature and in that atmospheric condition. And so all the pressure will be referred always to the saturation pressure at that pressure in that moment. And so the, the range of the pressure in, in a physisorption isotherm will be always ranging between zero and one. And so that all uh, material can be analyzed and compared uh, without, without problems. 
Luke, I have a question here on how would grinding a sample to a powder affect bulk density from a solid using mercury intrusion? Okay, so uh, as I mentioned in one of the slides, uh, the, um, the bulk and the envelope uh, densities can be measured by, by mercury intrusion. Uh, now what happens, if we have a solid material and we uh, analyze it with mercury intrusion, uh, the sample is uh, submitted to vacuum at the beginning. Uh, then the sample holder is filled with mercury. Now, if the material has pores less than, uh, um, than 650 nanometers, or anyway, the limit, depending on the, the vacuum degree we can apply at the beginning, mercury does not enter the pores. So what happens with a, a double weighing? So we weight the sample holder with mercury only. And then we weight the sample holder with mercury plus the sample when it was filled under vacuum by correcting the difference in, in the mercury presence, we can measure which is the volume of the material, including all the pores. Now what happens if I, and this is named uh, bulk or envelope density. Now what happens if I grind the material, I create uh, a, what we call the interparticle porosity that are uh, void spaces between the particles. Um, now, we can have several situations here because usually particles, due to the presence of surface roughness or surface charge, they aggregate. They tend to make an aggregation of particles, providing larger particles. So what happens in, in, in an aggregate, we have an empty space uh, that when we apply a pressure to, uh, uh, in the mercury uh, porosimeter, the aggregate suddenly breaks and the particles are compacted. So usually to measure properly, so the measure of uh, the, the envelope density that is referred to the volume of the particles excluding the interparticle voids with mercury intrusion is not so simple. Uh, especially if the particles themselves are porous. So we can measure the envelope density by mercury intrusion only if, uh, uh, first of all, we run a first pressurization to break the aggregates if they are present. Then going back to vacuum again and applying a second pressurization. And then we need to see if there is a clear distinction between the intrusion between in the interparticle voids and the intrusion into the pores. So in this case, if there is, a, a, let's say, a flat region, a plateau between the two intrusion, we can measure the envelope density with the mercury porosimetry. Otherwise, let's say, uh, better technique is uh, the, 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 the fluid uh, powder displacement technique, uh, because uh, does not has all these issues related to, to mercury intrusion porosimeters in measuring the envelope density. Luca, we have a tremendous number of questions today. Um, I, I think this will be the final question for you. Um, uh -huh. When you have a material that contains both micropores and mesopores, um, is DFT the best method for pore size determination? Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, because uh, uh, even if I'm, I'm not very expert about DFT, I, I had the chance to, um, to make a little bit of experience uh, using the software, microactive software. And the DFT uh, is, uh, um, as far as I understand, is considering the, uh, the adsorption as uh, the density of gas molecules on the surface. And this density changes on the surface depending on the pore size. Therefore, a number uh, knowing, uh, knowing uh, the, uh, uh, the material under test and the gas used and the temperature, uh, and the, 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 the DFT generates, uh, the DFT calculation generates a number of kernels, a number of isotherms that uh, represents the, uh, a lot of isotherms depending on the pore size. 
So uh, the DFT and the, the non-local density functional theorem can be applied in the complete isotherm range. And uh, uh, by st uh, starting from uh, the point of view of the density that is increasing uh, uh, while absorption uh, um, takes place, we can calculate a wider pore size distribution covering the complete range micropores and mesopores and even more we, we can cover up to 300 nanometers uh, uh, depending on the pore nature and uh, and the experimental conditions thank you luca um, is there anything else you'd like to mention about textual characterization this morning uh, no i just uh, want to uh, mention the um, let's say the 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 next uh, webinars that we will have uh, uh, in the following weeks, uh, because today we just considered the, the uh, uh, physical characterization at which can be the how to measure uh, porosity and surface area and how this parameter can influence uh, uh, diffusion, pro mainly diffusion problems and catalyst stability in uh, in a reaction in the catalytic reaction process. In the next webinar, uh, we will focus on uh, the surface reactivity and, and bulk reactivity characterization techniques for for catalysts. So this this uh, let's say this um, this um, uh, subject of a catalyst characterization is divided into uh, uh, two webinars. So the next one we will focus on uh, the uh, surface reactivity and the catalyst activity. Great. Thank you, uh, Luca, for the presentation, and thank you uh, for everyone that participated today. Uh, thank you for all the wonderful questions. There was an overwhelming number of questions, and um, the questions clearly make webinars better. So thank you for your participation. We hope you found it useful and beneficial. Uh, please check back for upcoming webinars at microverdicts.com slash webinars, and hope, you, and hope uh, we get to welcome you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody.